Okay, hello everyone. Well, Mr Cornish had the fantastic idea of producing uh, a video mark scheme for you on the Upper Sixth uh, Mock Chemistry paper. We marked this by question, uh, so I marked the multiple choice section, or some of it actually, uh, and also marked question 16. Uh, Dr. Renshaw marked question 17, Mr. Bellinger question 18, Dr. Mancino question 19, and Mr. Cornish uh, question 20. So we're now each going to go through the questions we marked, uh, giving you some, some important feedback on those questions. So we'll start with the multiple choice section. So this question is about four organic compounds. Let's have a quick look at these. We've got ethanol, an alcohol. We've got ethanol, an aldehyde. We've got ethanoic acid, uh, a carboxylic acid, and ethanoyl chloride, uh, an acyl chloride. Okay, so the first question is, which of those is oxidized by ammoniacal silver nitrate? Ammoniacal silver nitrate, you should know better, as Tollens reagent. And Tollens reagent is used to identify aldehydes. So the answer is B. What's the observation? Well, you get a silver mirror. So Tollens reagent contains diamine silver 1. This species here, you'll look at this more in unit 5 when you look at complex ions. Uh, essentially, it can contains Ag+, which gets reduced to uh, silver mirror. Okay, the, the most common incorrect answer here would probably have been ethanol, because you're thinking, well, Tollens reagent is an oxidising agent, Alcohols can be oxidized, so this could be the answer. Tollens, however, is a mild oxidizing agent. So it's not a strong enough oxidizing agent to oxidize alcohols. It will, however, oxidize aldehydes. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Which has the highest boiling temperature? So what are we thinking about here? Intermolecular forces, obviously. Okay, uh, so what do we have in ethanol and alcohol? Well, we have London forces, we have hydrogen bonding. In the aldehyde, we have London forces, but we don't have hydrogen bonding because we don't actually have hydrogen attached to the oxygen. So this hydrogen here is not delta positive enough to form a hydrogen bond. We do, however, have dipole-dipole forces because we still have the delta positive carbon and the delta negative oxygen here. Okay, ethanoic acid, we have London forces, we have hydrogen bonding. Uh, and then the acyl chloride, a little bit like the al aldehyde, this has London forces but also dipole-dipole uh, forces. We have the delta positive carbon, delta negative oxygen and chlorines. Uh, no hydrogen bonding here either. Okay, so which is going to have a higher boiling point out of ethanol and ethanoic acid? Well, ethanoic acid is actually a bigger molecule too. It has more electrons, so this is going to have stronger London forces in this. But more than that, carboxylic acids can form these dimers where pairs of carboxylic acid molecules are hydrogen bonded together into a dimer, which overall has stronger London forces and uh, therefore stronger intermolecular forces and a higher boiling temperature. So the answer here is C. Okay, moving on to the next question. Which of these will uh, reduce the largest amount of sodium dichromate 6, acidified dichromate 6, which is an oxidising agent? So we're basically uh, trying to work out which can be most oxidised, essentially. Well, alcohols, 
will be oxidized first to aldehydes and then to carboxylic acids. Aldehydes, of course, only oxidized to the carboxylic acid stage. Uh, carboxylic acids are not going to be oxidized uh, and the acyl chloride isn't going to be oxidized either. So the answer is A. The alcohol, because it can be oxidized to both an aldehyde and then a carboxylic acid. Okay, the final part to this question. Equal amounts of each uh, compound are added to identical volumes of water, which would have the lowest pH. Okay, the initial temptation might be to think, oh, well, it's ethanoic acid. Ethanols, uh, alcohols are neutral, aldehydes are neutral, uh, acyl chloride, well, that's not an acid, uh, so it must be the ethanoic acid. Well, think about what happens when you add an acyl chloride to water. An acyl chloride is going to react with water to form a carboxylic acid and HCl. HCl is a strong acid, it's going to dissolve in water completely to give you hydrogen ions and chloride ions. So one mole of ethanol chloride would give you a mole of ethanoic acid and a mole of hydrogen ions. So uh, clearly ethanol chloride is going to form the most acidic solution out of those four. Okay, moving on to question two now. So question two is about rates. And um, we've been given four different graphs and then we're asked a series of questions on these. So before we uh, get stuck into this question, let's think about common graphs that we're likely to encounter uh, for rates of reaction. So the types of graphs that we are going to come across are uh, concentration time graphs. Okay, um, we're going to come across these for zero order, first order, and uh, second order reactants. So if we have a, a zero order uh, reactant, its concentration is going to decrease at a constant rate with time. So that's zero order. Okay, for first order, we're going to have an exponential decay of concentration with time. And for second order, we're going to have a very rapid initial uh, decrease in concentration and then it will sort of level out a bit more, but obviously still tending to, to zero here. Uh, I've exaggerated that slightly, but that's the general idea. Okay, so that's concentration time graphs. Uh, the other type of graphs we're likely to come across are rate concentration graphs. So what do they look like? Okay, so for a zero order uh, reactant, remember that rate is not proportional to the concentration. Uh, so that means that rate does not change as concentration changes. So we just get a straight horizontal line like so. Okay, I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit here. Okay, for a first order reaction, rate equals K times concentration, which means that rate is directly proportional to concentration. So we'll see something like that. For second order, 
rate equals k times concentration squared, which means that uh, we're going to see a graph that looks like this. Okay, so these are the graphs we need to be familiar with. The rate concentration graphs, as I have here, and the concentration time graphs I have here. Okay, so let's go back to the question. So the first question is, uh, which of these graphs could be a graph of rate uh, against concentration for a zero order reactant? So rate against concentration for zero order, we're expecting to see this horizontal flat line. So the answer is clearly this one here. A. Okay, next question. Which could be a graph of rate of reaction against the square of the concentration? Okay, so that's really important here. Okay, what we've got is rate against the square of the concentration. So what that is saying is that, it's, it's this effectively, isn't it? Rate uh, plotted against the square of the concentration. And that is going to be a straight line if it's a second order relationship. So the confusing thing here is you may think, you know, this sort of graph is only true for a first order uh, reactant. Well, it would also be the case for a second order reactant if we were plotting against the square of the concentration, because then rate is proportional to concentration squared. Okay, right, next question. Which could be a graph of the concentration of a reactant against time for a first order reactant? So we're looking for this type of thing, a nice smooth exponential decay. So that is graph D here. Uh, sorry, did I, did I say for the pre... I didn't give you the answer to the previous question, did I? It's going to be B. So this question uh, was D, the nice smooth exponential decay. Okay, next question. A graph of the natural log of rate against the reciprocal of one over temperature. So this is basically the Arrhenius equation we're looking at here, isn't it? So Arrhenius equation is K equals A times E to the minus EA over RT. K is the rate constant, A is the pre-exponential factor, activation energy, gas constant, and temperature in Kelvin. If we take the natural log of K, we get the natural log of A, which is a constant, minus activation energy divided by R times 1 over T. So if we plot ln of K on the y-axis, 1 over T on the x-axis, we get intercept, uh, the constant, basically this thing here, uh, which is ln of A, and gradient minus EA over R, so that's our, our gradient here. Okay, uh, so this is uh, this has a straight line form. If we have one over temperature on the x-axis, ln of k on the y-axis, we're going to get a straight line with a negative gradient, which is equal to minus e a divided by r. Now, okay, note here, we haven't actually got ln uh, k, we've got ln of rate, but it's always true that rate is proportional to the rate constant. So because we're taking the log here, you can use ln of the rate instead of just ln of k. 
Right, question three then. So which of the following would form the best buffer solution with pH of five? So that's the key thing here. We've got an acidic solution. So this is going to be an acidic buffer. An acidic buffer is made from a weak acid and it's salt. Okay, so we're simply looking for a weak acid and it's salt. Straight away, ethanoic acid, sodium methanoate, there we go. Uh, nothing more we need to say about that answer uh, and that question, other than uh, ammonium chloride and ammonia would be a good example of a basic buffer. So that would have a pH of about 9, typically. We've got ammonia, uh, a weak base, and is salt, ammonium chloride. OK, moving on to question four. So still on acids and bases now, uh, and we're looking at some pH calculations. So first question, select the correct pH for a two molar solution of nitric acid. OK, nitric acid is a strong acid, so that means it will dissociate completely, and it means the concentration of the nitric acid is going to be equal to the concentration of hydrogen ions. Uh, pH equals minus log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So if the concentration of the nitric acid is 2 moles per litre, so will H+, plus. so minus log of 2 equals uh, minus 0 0.3. Don't be surprised by this. So a solution can have a negative uh, pH. As long as the concentration of hydrogen ions is greater than 1, uh, then the pH is going to be below 0. So, so don't be surprised. Uh, a very concentrated acid a very very strong acid, I should say, uh, could have, or a very concentrated strong acid could have a pH as low as minus 10, or, or even lower than that. Okay, next question. So now we're calculating the pH of a strong alkali, barium hydroxide. Okay, so again, this is going to dissociate uh, completely. But the thing to spot here is that one mole of barium hydroxide is going to give two moles of hydroxide ions. So the hydroxide ion concentration is going to equal two times the barium hydroxide concentration. So that means uh, 0.1 moles of 0.1 moles per litre barium hydroxide will give us 0.2 moles per litre of hydroxide ions. Okay, so how do we get uh, to a pH from here? Well, there's a couple of ways we could do it. We could use the expression for Kw. So Kw equals the concentration of hydrogen ions multiplied by the concentration of hydroxide ions. So that means H plus equals Kw over OH minus. Uh, and we would then take minus log of H plus. The other way to do it would be to say that pKw equals pH plus pOH. We would calculate pOH just in the same way we do pH. So pOH equals minus log of OH minus and minus log of 0.2 uh, is 0.7. So pKW uh, minus log of 1 times 10 to the minus 14 is 14. So uh, Rearranging for pH, we get pH equals 14 minus pOH, or minus 0 
13.3. So the answer is B. The key thing with this question, recognising that one mole of barium hydroxide gives you two moles of hydroxide ions. Uh, and then using the expression for Kw to get the concentration of H+, or going via this method. Okay. Uh, the next question. So I suspect that this is the one that caused most problems. Okay, so a mixture of 20 centimetres cubed of one mole uh, per litre HCl and 10 centimetres cubed of one mole per litre sodium hydroxide. Okay, how many moles of HCl have we got in 20 centimetres cubed of a one molar solution? Well, you should be able to work out fairly, fairly quickly that's 0 0.02 moles of HCl. How many moles of sodium hydroxide have you got in 10 centimetres cubed of a one molar solution? 0 0.01 moles. Okay, so if you mix these together, this sodium hydroxide will neutralise 0.01 moles of the HCl. That's going to leave us with 0.01 moles of acid behind, okay? But what volume is that in? It's in a volume of 10 plus 20 centimetres cubed. So that's in a total volume of 30 cm cubed. So we now calculate the concentration, 1,000 times moles over volume, and uh, we'll find that we have a 0 0.33 uh, moles per litre solution. Take the minus log of this, and you're going to get a pH of about 0 0.48. So the key thing here is recognising that uh, we're going to have some neutralisation happening and that whichever was in excess initially, there's going to be either some acid or base left behind. In this case, it's the acid. Uh, we need to factor in the total volume of the solution, calculate its concentration and then determine the, the pH. Okay, question five. So it's about conjugate acid-base pairs uh, with the reaction of ammonia with water. So NH3 plus H2O is going to form a solution of ammonium hydroxide, isn't it? NH4 plus and OH minus. Okay, the ammonia, well, we know ammonia is a base anyway, don't we? Uh, it's accepted a proton from the water, so this is a base. That means the water is acting as an acid. Uh, if we're over on this side, this ammonium ion can donate a hydrogen ion, so it can act as an acid, uh, to the OH minus reforming this. So this will be an acid. So this is base one, uh, an acid one. These two go together, and then... If we call this acid uh, 2, this is going to be base 2. These two go together uh, because this can accept uh, a proton to form this or this can donate a proton to form this. So the bases are ammonia and the hydroxide ions. Okay, question six. So this is about oleic acid, uh, the structure which is given here. Uh, first part, the systematic name. Okay, well, we can see it's a carboxylic acid. Here's carbon number one. Uh, we've then got seven carbons uh, with these seven CH2 groups. So that's carbons two to eight in there. That means this is carbon number nine. This is carbon number 10. And then we have uh, another eight carbons all together up here. So that's going to be carbons 11 to 18 up in this bit. It's a Z isomer because the priority groups are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond up here. Uh, and we can see that uh, the... 
the carboxylic acid bit is connected to uh, the the sorry the alkene is starting at carbon number nine. That's the lowest number we can use. So it's going to be Z octadec nine in oic acid rather than a carbon eight is up here. So that's B. Okay, next question. Uh, intermolecular forces. Okay, obviously it has London forces. Everything with electrons has London forces. Okay, does it have hydrogen bonding? Yes, because we have an OH group there. We have hydrogen bonded to electronegative oxygen, so it does have H bonding. Does it have dipole-dipole forces too? Well, yes. This side, this, th these groups are fixed up here. These groups are fixed down here. We have quite a delta negative group up here. It's going to be more delta positive down here. So this molecule definitely does have a permanent dipole. So it has dipole-dipole forces as well. So the answer to this one is C. H bonds, dipole-dipole and London forces. Okay, next question. Uh, species most likely to cause a peak at mass over charge 45. So it's going to have to be an iron, isn't it? Mass spectrometers detect positively charged iron, so it has to be B or A. Do these both add up to 45, 24, 28, 29? Yes, they do. But is there any way we can get a CH2, CH2, OH fragment from this molecule? Uh, no, there isn't. The atoms are not connected in this way at any part in the molecule. We do have the carboxylic acid group. So this could easily be fragmented and losing an electron with a positive charge. So the answer is D. Okay, final part of the question. What would you expect to see if you tested it with bromine water and PCL5? Well, bromine water is test for a carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, it would decolorize from orange. Do we have a carbon-carbon double bond? Yes, we do. So we're going to see it decolorizing. PCL5 is a test for an OH group. What would we see? We would see misty fumes of HCl being given off if there's an OH group. Is there an OH group? Yes, there is in the carboxylic acid group. So we're going to see the bromine water decolorize. We're going to see steamy fumes or misty fumes of HCl. The answer is A. Question seven. So this is about uh, the reversible reaction here. Uh, the decomposition of methane hydrate giving us methane and water. So it's a reversible reaction. We're told that it's an endothermic process and we can see that we have more moles of gas on the right hand side. One mole of gas here, no moles of gas over here. So forward, the first question is about increasing the yield of methane and we can see that the conditions are changing temperature and pressure. So let's think about this. Forward reaction is endothermic. That means if we increase the temperature, it would shift the equilibrium to the right in the endothermic direction. That would give us a bigger yield of methane. So increasing temperature will shift us this way. Uh, in terms of pressure, if we decreased pressure, it would shift us to the right because there are more moles of gas on the right hand side. So if we, uh, if, if we uh, decrease the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to increase the pressure, uh, so a low pressure. High temperature, low pressure. The answer is A. Okay, next question B. Which of the following would decrease the value of the equilibrium constant? Okay, remember, equilibrium constants are just that. They are constant. The only thing that affects them is temperature. Okay, so straight away, we know it's going to have to be uh, C or D. We know it's an endothermic reaction. If you increase the temperature, it's going to increase uh, the value of K. It will push it to the right. If uh, we decrease temperature, 
uh, that will decrease the value of k. So the answer is c. And remember, we can explain that in terms of uh, the relationship between total entropy and the equilibrium constant. So if k is going to get smaller, delta s total is going to have to get smaller. Delta s total equals delta s system uh, plus minus delta h over t. Delta S surroundings plus Delta S system. Uh, if we have an endothermic reaction, so positive Delta H, decreasing the temperature is going to make this term uh, bigger, which is going to make uh, Delta S total smaller, Delta S total is smaller, k is going to be smaller. So decreasing temperature makes this bigger. This for an endothermic reaction is positive. So a big value for this is going to make this small, which will make this small. Okay, question eight. So now we're talking about mechanisms, okay, and uh, optical activity. So 3-chloro-3-methylhexane. So this is a tertiary halogenoalkane. And we hopefully know that tertiary halogenoalkanes react by SN1 because they form stable uh, carbocation intermediates. Uh, the carbocation intermediates are planar species, so they can be attacked by a nucleophile from either side with equal probability. And what that, this means is that we are going to get a racemic mixture. Okay, so let's have a look through the options here. Okay, a racemic mixture forms because 3 chloro 3 methylhexane forms a carbocation intermediate. Well, yes, that's true. Uh, could it be B, reactions nucleophilic substitution? No, because SN2, uh, an SN2 mechanism for this reaction would not form uh, a racemic mixture. We would get stereochemical inversion, just one enantiomer in reformed. Uh, a five bonded transition state here that would occur again in the SN2 mechanism. Uh, and the final answer because it contains a chiral carbon, well, no, I mean, this, this the fact that it has a chiral carbon means that you're going to have enantiomers uh, in this case, uh, and that means that you could have more uh, of one than the other or not. So the answer is quite clearly A. Okay, moving on to question nine. So which of these is the repeat unit of the polymer formed uh, from this monomer? Uh, I always like to draw these out. So we have a carbon-carbon double bond. Attached to carbon-carbon double bond, we have an H, an OH, an H, and a methyl group. Okay, uh, so once we form the addition polymer, we get a single bond between the carbons in the middle. We still have the same four groups attached to these carbons. And then this is, so this is the repeat unit of the polymer. Uh, so to one of the carbons, we have an H and an OH bonded. To the other carbon, we have an H and a CH3 group. If we look at the various options present, we can see that A is the only one that fits with that, where we have an OH and an H joined to this carbon, and an H and a CH3 joined to this carbon here. Okay, question 10 is about chromatography. Uh, Chromatography is used to separate uh, mixtures, and in all forms of chromatography, we have a stationary phase and we have a mobile phase. 
and the different substances in the mixtures have a different affinity for the mobile phase compared to the stationary phase. So some bind strongly to the stationary phase, some uh, do not bind strongly to the stationary phase and, and are more uh, attracted to the, to, or have a greater affinity for the mobile phase. So we're not just talking about uh, one phase or the other here, it's how they interact with both of the different phases. So the answer is C. Okay, question 11. Sulfuric acid is added to phenylamine. What is the product of the reaction? Okay, well, phenylamine is an aromatic amine where we have an NH2 group bonded to a benzene ring. So the lone pair on this nitrogen atom uh, makes this group basic. This means it can accept uh, a hydrogen ion forming an ammonium salt. So we get the phenyl ammonium ion here. So this is all that's happening here. Okay. Now th this reaction is, is very similar to the reaction of ammonia with sulfuric acid. What would happen there? NH3 plus H2SO4. Well, we'll protonate the ammonia to get ammonium ions and we'll get left with a sulfate anion. Uh, but we have two acidic protons in the sulfuric acid, so we would need two of those to uh, accept them. So we would have two ammonium ions and a sulfate anion. So NH4, 2, SO4. And the, the, exactly the same thing is going to happen here. So two phenylamine uh, molecules will accept protons and become phenyl ammonium ions, and then we'll have the sulfate anion. The answer is D. Okay, so question 12. This, is, uh, this tells us that butylamine has a higher boiling temperature than propylamine. Uh, why is that? So let's just think about the two molecules briefly. So butylamine uh, has an amine group attached uh, to a chain of four carbon atoms. So one, two, three, four. Propylamine has an amine group attached to a chain of three carbon atoms. So we can see these are both primary amines uh, with different length of carbon chain. I mean, straight away, we can see that the reason this is going to have a higher boiling point than this is essentially because we've got larger molecules with more electrons and stronger London forces. Uh, the hydrogen bonding is going to be very similar in both molecules, so this must be the answer. Uh, I hope that nobody put answer D. Uh, Obviously, it has nothing to do with the covalent bonds at all. It's simply to do with intermolecular forces, and butylamine has stronger London forces than propylamine because it has more electrons. Okay, question 13. So this is about the identification of amino acids uh, in chromatography. Ninhydrin can be used to identify the position because if you uh, spray amino acids with ninhydrin and warm them up, you get a purple colour due to something called Rumen's purple. So ninhydrin has this uh, structure. And this will react with primary amines to form uh, a compound called Rumen's purple with a big sort of conjugated system uh, of alternating single and double bonds, uh, which absorbs visible light and so has quite an intense purple colour, uh, has this 
structure here, but you don't need to know that. So this is called Riemann's purple. Uh, okay, so let's look at the options. Reacts with amino acids to form a compound with an intense colour. Yes, that's true. Uh, reacts with amino acids to form compounds, each which has a characteristic colour. No, they're, they're all purple. Actually, there is an exception. So secondary amines uh, form, do react with uh, ninhydrin, but they give you a yellow or orange colour. And that's because they form something called iminium uh, salts. But actually, you don't need to know anything about that. There's only one amino acid uh, that would give that, and that is promine, proline, where you have the amine is part of a cyclic uh, five-membered ring. So that's called proline. And that would actually give you a yellow or orange colour with an anhydrin, but essentially all of the others... Uh, have a primary amine group and they would all give you this purple colour due to the formation of Riemann's purple. Right, question 14. Okay, so alanine. So alanine is the second uh, simplest alpha amino acid, glycine being the first. So we have a methyl group and a hydrogen atom bonded to the central uh, carbon. And then we have the carboxylic acid group and the amine group. So this is uh, alanine, or the proper chemical name for this would be 2-amino-1-2-3 propanoic acid. 2-amino propanoic acid. Okay, here we have an acid group with an acidic proton. Here we have a basic group with a lone pair on the nitrogen. So what happens with amino acids is we form zwitterions, where the carboxylic acid group from one uh, amino acid molecule becomes deprotonated and protonates the amine group in an adjacent amino acid molecule, giving us a zwitterion. And this occurs both in solids and in solution. Uh, so this explains why amino acids have such high melting points for their size, uh, because there are ionic attractions between adjacent molecules. Not just because of hydrogen bonding, don't say that, it's because of the ionic attractions between adjacent molecules. So if we look at structure A here, well, this has the carboxylic acid group, the amine group, the methyl group, the hydrogen. This is the structure of alanine, but this is the neutral structure of alanine. Uh, in this version here, we've deprotonated this group, but this isn't protonated, so that's not correct. Here, we've protonated the amine group, but we still have a neutral carboxylic acid group. This is the correct one, where we have deprotonated the carboxylic acid group and protonated the amine group, which is essentially the same as this here. Okay, and then the final question is about recrystallization. Uh, so we do this to purify solids. So what does the procedure involve? First of all, you dissolve uh, your compound in a minimum amount of hot solvent. Uh, you then do a hot filtration. The hot filtration removes insoluble impurities, things uh, that haven't dissolved, uh, so you remove them at that stage. Okay. You then cool the filtrate down and you allow your compound to precipitate uh, out. Uh, it has a lower solubility at the lower temperature, so it crystallizes. Uh, now, the key thing here is that you use the minimum amount of hot solvent. So the soluble impurities remain dissolved and, and they don't precipitate out or crystallize out. So you then filter uh, uh, this and retain the crystals because that's what you want and you then wash them with further cold solvent to further remove soluble impurities. So the hot filtration is to remove insoluble impurities, the cold filtration is to remove the soluble impurities. And that's the end of section A.
Okay, so this question, question 16, is about calcium chloride. First of all, forming calcium chloride from the reaction of calcium and chlorine, and then about dissolving calcium chloride in water. Right, so the first part of the question asks us to calculate delta S system for this reaction here. Uh, always look for key things in the question. Look, we must include a sign and units. Okay, how do we calculate delta S system? So delta S system equals the sum of the molar entropy of the products minus the sum of the molar entropy of the reactants. We're going, we've been provided with some data here, uh, the molar entropy of chlorine molecules but we're going to need to get some more from the data booklet here. Okay, so first of all, we need the molar entropy of calcium chloride. We go to the data booklet. Okay, uh, calcium chloride is an inorganic compound, so we need to go to this section. Selected inorganic compounds, physical and thermochemical data, page 24. Okay, so we see the molar entropies are given in this column here. Uh, we need to obviously now fi find calcium compounds, which are here, and calcium chloride. We go across and we find the molar entropy is 104.6 joules per Kelvin per mole. So delta S system equals 104.6 minus the sum of the molar entropies of the reactants. Okay, so we need calcium. Calcium is an element. So let's go back to our data booklet and physical and thermochemical data of the elements is given right at the front of the booklet uh, from page two. So here we go, calcium has an atomic number of 20, there it is. We come across to find its molar entropy, which is 41.4 joules per Kelvin per mole. So minus 41.4 for the calcium, plus 165 for uh, chlorine. And we should get an answer of minus 101.8 joules per Kelvin, big K, per mole. Information in the question has been given to three significant figures, so that would be appropriate for the answer as well, although we haven't been asked to specify this answer to a certain number of significant figures. Okay, moving on then. So explain fully what a sign uh, for delta S system uh, is as you would expect. Okay, well, let's just have a look at the reaction equation here. We've got one mole of calcium, which is a solid, reacting with one mole of chlorine, which is a gas, forming one mole of calcium chloride, an ionic solid. Okay, so what's happening is we've gone from one mole of solid, one mole of gas, to one mole of solid. Solids are much more ordered than gases. Dis energy can be distributed more ways within a gas because gases have more degrees of freedom. So we can see as we go from the reactants to the products, disorder is decreasing or order is increasing. So what are the key things we should be saying for this answer here? Well, one mole of solid and one mole of gas react to form one mole of gas. Okay, now a key thing here is that we've said one mole and not molecules. 
Because obviously we don't have molecules of calcium and we don't have molecules of calcium chloride. So do not say that because it will cost you a mark. We do have molecules of chlorine but not of these two. So we should be talking about moles rather than molecules. Okay, that statement alone would get you two marks for this question. For essentially saying that the number of moles is decreasing, two going to one, and for saying that we're going from solid and gas to simply gas. And the reason is that gases are more disordered than solids. So entropy is decreasing as we move from reactants to products. Okay, next part of the question. So, calculate the total entropy change uh, for this reaction, giving your answer to three significant figures. So, delta S total equals delta S surroundings plus delta S system. We've been given delta S surroundings at the very beginning of this question. That's plus 2,670 joules per mole per Kelvin. And we've just calculated delta S system, which is minus 102 joules per Kelvin per mole. So 2670 plus minus 102, which gives us 2,568 joules per Kelvin per mole. But remember, we must give our answer to three significant figures, 2,570 joules per Kelvin per mole. And again, always include a sign, okay? Any enthalpy, any entropy value, always include a sign and units with your final answer. Okay, part C. So we've been asked to calculate the entropy change of the surroundings, uh, or, or sorry, use the entropy change of the surroundings to calculate delta H for the reaction. Okay, what's the link between delta S surroundings and delta H? Well, delta S surroundings equals minus delta H over T. Rearranging this for delta H, we multiply through by minus temperature. So delta H equals minus delta S surroundings times T. Uh, Delta S surroundings was 2,670, so we've got minus 2,670 times the temperature in Kelvin, 298. And this gives us a value of minus 795660 joules per mole. So minus 796 kilojoules per mole. So we'll get one mark for correctly stating the equation here and one mark for the correct answer. We were given the units up here. Uh, good idea to include them again. If you're going to write the units, make sure you write the correct ones. Okay, and obviously this is an exothermic reaction. It should have the negative sign. Okay, so now we go on to the next part of the question, which concerns dissolving calcium chloride in water. So we've got 0 0.05 moles of calcium chloride. We're dissolving that in 51.8 centimetres cubed of water, giving us 50 centimetres cubed of a one molar solution uh, with a temperature rise of 15 degrees C. So the first part of the question, Calculate the energy transferred in joules, and we're given an equation to use. Now, actually, no, this is not a good question because the units of the volume are not specified. So 
we, we don't know. We're left to guess here. Are the units centimetres cubed or are they decimeters cubed? Well, I think we have to assume they're centimetres cubed. Uh, We've just been given a number here, 4.2. I mean, okay, we should know that this is the heat capacity of water. 4.2 joules uh, of energy is needed to raise one gram by one degree. But the units aren't given. That's not good. Uh, and then we've got delta T, the temperature change here. Okay, the volume of the solution is 50 times 4.2 times the temperature change, which is 15, 3,150 joules. We don't need to worry about a sign here because it's asking us for the energy transferred. This is the amount of energy transferred. It was a temperature rise, so this will have been released. It is an exothermic process, isn't it? Uh, before we move on, note would it have been correct to use 51.8 centimetres cubed of water in this case? Well, actually, probably yes, because if you have 51.8 centimetres cubed of water, then you have 51.8 grams of water. Uh, so that is another problem with this question, actually. If you had abused this value, that would have been equally fine to using 50. It's not a good question. OK, calculate the enthalpy change of solution of calcium chloride in kilojoules per mole. So for delta H here, uh, this is an energy per mole. So we need to divide the heat uh, transferred divided by the number of moles. The heat uh, transferred we calculated in the previous question, so that's 3150. The number of moles of calcium chloride was 0 0.05. This gives us an answer of 63,000 joules per mole. But remember, this is an exothermic process, so delta H has a negative sign. So minus 63 kilojoules per mole. Okay, moving on to the final part of the question then. So this, so now we have a Hess cycle, which we are going to use to calculate the uh, hydration enthalpy of chloride ions. Well, let's label this diagram we've been given here. So at the top, we can see we've got one mole of gaseous chloride ions, um, uh, sorry, one mole of gaseous calcium ions and two moles of gaseous chloride ions. As we come down to here, we've got one mole of calcium chloride solid, one mole of an ionic solid. So this change here is the lattice enthalpy of calcium chloride. If we look at this energy change here, we're going from one mole of ionic solid to one mole of aqueous calcium ions and two moles of aqueous chloride ions. This is dissolving the ionic solid, isn't it? So this is delta H solution, uh, the value we calculated in the previous question. If we go down here, we've taken gaseous ions and we've converted them to aqueous ions. So this is the sum of the hydration enthalpies, i.e. one calcium ion and two chloride ions. Okay, so what Hess's law tells us is that this energy change must equal this plus that. So if we start at the top and come down to here, there's two ways of getting there. This way or this way this enthalpy change must be equal to that total enthalpy change. So, delta H lat plus delta H solution equals the sum of delta H hydration. Okay, what is 
the sum of delta H hydration? Well, it's delta H hydration of one calcium ion plus two times delta H hydration of chloride because we have two moles of chloride being hydrated. So we want to rearrange this equation for delta H hydration of a chloride ion. So that's going to be delta H lat plus delta H solution minus delta H hydration of calcium all divided by 2. Okay, so values then. The lattice enthalpy of calcium chloride we are going to need to get from the data book. So if we go to our data book, we can see lattice energies are on page 12. So going to page 12, we find calcium, we come across to chloride, and we find that lattice enthalpy is 2258. Now remember, these are negative lattice enthalpies, so lattice enthalpies are always exothermic, so this is a minus value. So this is minus 2258. Uh, plus delta H solution, well that was minus 63 kilojoules per mole. Uh, we've been given the hydration enthalpy of the calcium ion at the top here, which is minus 1560, so that's minus minus 1560, so plus 1560, and then the whole lot divided by two. And that gives us an answer of minus 380 0.5 kilojoules per mole. Now, actually, this question seemed a bit unfamiliar, but really, you, you have sort of seen this, really, at sort of AS, and certainly at A2 as well. I think it was the unfamiliar format of this question that, that confused pupils, uh, and I remember that when marking this for the exam board too. Okay, so let's move on to the, the last two parts of this question now. So draw diagrams to represent hydrated calcium ions and hydrated chloride ions. Well, calcium ions have a positive charge. When they're hydrated in water, the delta negative oxygen atoms from water molecules are going to be attracted to the positively charged ions. So these are iron dipole interactions that we've got here. A typical mistake here would be to put full negative charges on the oxygens and full positive charges on the hydrogens. Uh, also remember that calcium is a two plus ion, not a single plus. Calcium is in group two. And if we think about chloride, anion, chloride is negatively charged, so the delta positive hydrogens of water will be attracted to the chloride and the water molecules will orient themselves around the chloride ions as follows. Okay, final part of the question then. Uh, so suggest why the addition of anhydrous calcium chloride to water results in an increase in temperature and decrease in volume. So we were told previously that the volume decreased from 51.8 to 50 centimetres cubed. The temperature increase is simply because it's an exothermic process. Okay, that's all we need to say. So dissolving calcium chloride in water is exothermic. Why is this? Because the energy released 
from the iron dipole uh, forces here is greater than the energy required to break the bonds in the ionic lattice. A, a common misconception here would be to say that breaking bonds releases energy. Breaking bonds does not release energy. That is endothermic. It needs energy. The energy released is from these iron dipole interactions that are formed, and that is greater than the energy needed to break up the lattice. Okay, that, that's pretty straightforward. Why does the volume decrease? That's a bit trickier. Well, essentially, because the water molecules become more ordered once they are hydrating these ions. The water molecules are strongly attracted to the ions, so they cluster around them uh, as a cage. That means they're more ordered uh, after the ionic solid has dissolved than they were before, where they were freer to move around in solution. So the volume decreases because the water molecules are ordered or clustered around the ions. Okay, so that's question 16. Uh, Dr. Renshaw will next be going through question 17. So when I approach a question like uh, this question that we have in question 17 on the mock, the first thing I do is uh, draw out these structures in either displayed or skeletal formula, because I find these um, structural kind of formulas written like this quite hard to see what the structure actually is. So if we just start by uh, writing out what these are, it gives us a clear idea of what transitions and what functional groups are actually changing as we go through. So the first one we've got is a butan 2-ol there, okay, and then we've got um, butanone, then we are still keeping our chain, but butanone, we've created an OH group, and we've added a nitrile group, Okay, that's quite hard to see sometimes if you've not drawn it out. And then we've still again got a four chain of carbons where we've still got our OH here, um, but we now have a carboxylic acid group there. So we can actually see what changes we've gone on. We've gone from alcohol to a ketone, we've gone from a ketone to a hydroxynitrile, we've gone from a nitrile to a carboxylic acid. So you can see those major functional group changes as we step through. So even before you've even attempted the questions, you can see where they're actually going to be pointing you towards. So if we look at A1, it says give the reagents and conditions for step one. Step one was um, the alcohol to the ketone. So for this, you need potassium dichromate six, in sulfuric acid. The conditions, because it does ask you for the conditions and the reagents, we're going to reflux it. Okay, If you just put warm, you wouldn't get the marks. You could also write distill. Both would get you the mark. That is one mark. That is one mark. You have to write both the potassium dichromate and sulfuric acids if you want to get the mark. Okay, you can write the formula, obviously potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7. If you write acidified um, uh, dichromate ions, then that would be absolutely fine as well. But you must ensure you've written the acid there as well. So if we look at A part two, it says butanone is formed in step one. Give a chemical test to identify the carbon group and a further test to show the presence of the methyl ketone group. Okay. Both tests give the observations that you would make. A carbonyl group, the best test is use Brady's reagent, okay, which is 2,4, um, oh, reagent, which is 2,4 DNPH, or you could have written 2,4 DNP. Now, some people did try to write dinitrophenylhydrazine. 
And I would avoid writing it out in full because if you spell it wrong, you won't get the marks because the difference between hydrazine and a hydrozone is, is subtle, but is only one letter when spelling, and therefore I would avoid writing it. So that's your um, the test. What would you get? Well, you'd either get a yellow or an orange precipitate out from it. Methyl ketone, this is the I autoform test, which is actually iodine and sodium hydroxide. Result, pale yellow precipitate. You could have also written solid as well. In terms of marks, one for that, one there, one for either iodoform test or I2 and Na. Okay, so B part one of question 17 in step two, butanone undergoes an addition reaction with HCN in the presence of CN minus ions. Give the mechanism for this reaction. Okay, very standard mechanism that comes up nearly every year, the formation of a hydroxy nitrile from a ketone or aldehyde. So let's start. You can either draw it out in the displayed or skeletal formula. I'm going to do displayed. So if you can draw out butanone to start with. Okay, so we've got butanone here and we've got our CN minus and that's going to be our nucleophile attacking in. Now the minus charge is actually associated with the carbon, therefore this is where your arrow needs to come from. You can draw a lone pair on the carbon as well to show the electrons coming from there. But it's definitely not coming from the nitrogen, it's the carbon that's doing the attacking. So make sure we draw a curly arrow and it comes and attacks the carbon of the carbon up. Make sure your arrow goes to this carbon, okay? It can't go somewhere near it or somewhere in between. It must go to the carbon, okay? This would then mean we'd have five bonds around carbon, so we can't have that. Therefore, we break the double bonds over here and the electrons come up and onto the oxygen. So they come up there. We then form the intermediate. So then draw the intermediate out where you've got an O minus up here and you've added C triple bond N, your nitrile there. Now the last bit is the protonation of this. We're in acidic conditions because we've got HCN. Therefore we can literally just use a curly arrow to go towards a H plus ion. You don't need to show the formation of the H plus ion. Okay, uh, you do, you can just show that. Make sure your arrows are going from the negative to the positive, not the other way around. They never go the other way around. Then draw out the final product that you get. This should be a sanity check at this point because you can compare it back to your answer that you gave or that you drew out at the very start uh, in the reaction scheme. Uh, and then this is that product there of the third box down. So one mark would be for the arrows correct at the beginning. Both arrows need to be correct and specific. One mark for the intermediate and making sure the charge is in the right place. And then the final mark is for this final arrow going to the positive uh, hydrogen to then be able to protonate um, your intermediate here. So B2, by considering the mechanism of the reaction explained by the addition of hydrogen cyanide to butanone, gives a solution which has no effect on the plane of polarization of plane polarized light. Well, obviously, this question is talking about optical isomers. You've seen the use of plane, plane polarized light, okay, and no effect on the plane. Well, this is going to indicate, because if we look at our product here, we actually are generating a chiral center. Therefore, it should be optically active but actually there's no effect. Therefore, we've, the mixture forms a racemic mixture. Okay. Okay, that's one mark, but this is obviously due to the chiral center. Why does it form that racemic mixture? Well, this is because the bonds around CO 
carbon double O bonds are planar. That will give you another mark. You could also say that the carbonyl group or the reaction site is trigonal planar or the bonds around the carbonyl group are planar. Okay? Butanone is not planar. That will not get you a mark. The CO bond is, is planar, wouldn't get you a mark. The carbonyl bond is planar, wouldn't get you a mark. It's saying the bonds around the CO group are planar. Okay? And therefore, cyanide can attack from either side. Or you could write above or below. There is equal chance of this attack. Final mark for stating something about where the cyanide is attacking from. Okay, C1 is the type of reaction occurring in step three. Well, this was just hydrolysis. Okay, and then C2 explain why the presence of the alcoholic hydroxyl group cannot be confirmed in the inference spectra of 2 hydroxy 2 methyl butanoic acid. Well, this is because the peaks are going to overlap. Okay, yes, there is an OH peak. Um, causing um, from the alcohol and there's an OH peak from the carboxylic acid. So you've got this bit and this bit, but the OH absorptions for the alcohol and carboxylic acid overlap. Okay, this would give you the mark. Could also state something that the OH absorption for the acid is very broad, or quote some data book values. You've got a data book in the exam, you can quote some values that show that these actually overlap. If you wrote that the OH absorptions were similar or the same, that would also gain you the mark. But just stating that they both have OH groups is not enough just to get one mark. You needed to say something about this absorption, okay, and why we're not going to see it in the IR. C part three, the hydrogen and the alcohol group and two hydroxy two methyl butanoic acid can be identified by a single peak in the NMR spectrum. Give the chemical shift you'd expect for this peak. Well, the data book states it's between two to four ppm. Okay, if you wrote any shift within this range, you get the mark. Anything outside, no mark. Okay. 10 C4, explain why in high resolution NMR the peak due to the hydrogens of the two methyl group and two hydroxy to methylbutanoic acid as a singlet. This is because there's no hydrogen atoms on the adjacent carbon atom. You'd also probably get the mark if you stated something that there were no hydrogens within three bonds away. Uh, carbon, um, hydrogen and hydrogen splitting um, in NMR tends to only occur at over three bonds. Therefore, any more than that, you won't be actually able to see it. But this is the good answer that will get you, get you the marks. If you'd just written there were no adjacent hydrogens or neighboring protons or something like that, you'd have also got the mark. The last part of this question is molecules of 2 hydroxy 2 methyl butanoic acid react together to form a condensation polymer. Draw a displayed formula for this polymer, showing two repeating units. Well, I'm going to draw the monomer to start with just to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to draw it slightly differently to how I drew it earlier. But here is our butanoic chain. One, two, three, four. If we're numbering it, one, two. We've got a hydroxy and we've got a methyl group. So that's my monomer unit. And what you're having is a condensation polymer where you're going to lose H2O, the O and H, and the H from here. So if we're going to bind this with another one, we're going to form an ester bond, okay? So if we want to draw the product, starting with one monomer unit over here, There's my one monomer unit and then my ester bond.
making sure we're drawing all of the carbon chain in. Okay. Brackets are a good thing to add. You don't need the N um, on the outside the brackets here because it, it asks you for just two repeating units. It was one mark for the ester linkage in the center and then one mark for getting the rest of the structure correct there. Okay, so question 18. We're told that persulfate ions, S2O8 2 minus, oxidize iodide ions in aqueous solution to form iodine and sulfate ions, S2O4 2 minus. And we're asked to, for part A, we're asked to write the ionic equation for this reaction and it says state symbols are not required. So the first stage is to construct the two half equations. So use the information that you've been given. So we know that S2 O8 2 minus goes to SO4 2 minus and then follow the rules that we have for building half equations so balance for matter other than hydrogen and oxygen um, oxygen is balanced no hydrogen there so those steps are not required we've got 2 minus on this side 2 times 2 minus on this side so 4 minus so I need 2 electrons on this side and then iodide ions are oxidized to I2 so I need to balance for matter and then balance for charge and that is now a complete half equation so combining these two half equations is two electrons in both of them so I can simply combine them S2O8 2 minus plus 2I minus goes to 2SO4, 2 minus plus I2, and obviously the electrons cancel each other out. Okay, part B, we're uh, exploring the, how the iodide, concentration of iodide ions affects this reaction, and what is outlined is the clock method. So starch is used as an indicator, uh, iodine turns uh, starch blue-black, which we'll come to in a minute. And sodium thiosulfate is used um, as uh, to make the clock reaction work. A fixed volume of sodium thiosulfate is used, um, and the a fixed amount of the persulfate per ions is kept. So all we're changing is the iodide ions. The effect of the thiosulfate ions is to reduce the iodine back to I minus. You don't need the, um, the equation for that process, um, but you'd have come across it many times at AS level. It's this. So the thiosulfate ions reduces um, iodine back to iodide okay so that's the um, that's the balanced equation for the reduction of uh, iodine back to iodide so the way that the clock reaction works is that the moment that the iodine is produced, this thiosulfate reduces it back to iodide. And therefore, the iodine doesn't get a chance to turn the starch indicator blue-black until the thiosulfate has run out. So this, therefore, can be used as a measure of reaction rate because we can take, take a measure of the time it takes for the blue-black to appear, and the blue-black colour will appear the moment that first drop of iodine is produced when the uh, thiosulfate has run out. And if we use a fixed amount of um, thiosulfate each time, we're measuring the, uh, a fixed amount of um, iodide being oxidised to iodine, and therefore the moment that it goes blue-black is a measure uh, the time it takes, one over the time it takes, is a measure of the initial rate of reaction. Okay, so let's 
go through what we've been asked. That's a dis discussion that I've just taken you through of the principles behind this method that's outlined. So the first question that we're asked is what is the final colour of the reaction mixture? Okay, so eventually this thiosulfate runs out and the iodine is then remaining and that as we know as we just said is turn, turn starch blue black so the answer to this first part is blue black um, and the mark scheme allowed you to say blue or black um, but not purple because purple is the color of iodine in, um, in something like uh, cyclohexane um, what would be observed if the reaction was carried out without the addition of sodium thiosulfate? Well, if we didn't have the thiosulfate to reduce the iodine back to iodide, then the solution will go blue-black immediately. The moment that this sulfate oxidizes the iodide to iodine, the solution would turn blue-black. So the answer to this part is immediately ideally write a, a proper sentence so the solution immediately turns blue-black. Um, explain why the concentration of iodide ions remains constant until the mixture changes colour. So here it's testing to see if you've understood the principles of the clock reaction so you need to just say something along the lines of the fact that um, whilst thiosulfate remains the moment that iodine is reduced, it's reduced back to iodide. And so the, this concentration of iodide remains, remains constant until the thiosulfate runs out. So we can say something along those lines. The concentration of iodide ions remains constant until the thiosulfate because the moment I2 is produced, it is reduced back to I minus by the thiosulfate. Okay. So we've then been given some data to plot um, to look at the effect of iodide concentration on the rate of reaction. Uh, we've got this data here, so we've got the uh, concentration of iodide, the time it takes for the um, starch to turn blue-black, and 1 over time, which is obviously a measure of the rate, because the longer uh, that time takes, the slower the reaction. So 1 over time gives us a, a measure of rate. And we've been asked to plot um, a graph of 1 over time on the vertical axis, in other words, rate, um, against concentration of the iodide ions on the x-axis. So a graph of rate against concentration. So in a question like this, the first thing that I would do is to write on my axis uh, what I've been asked to plot, because firstly, that makes me clear on what I'm plotting, but it also means I don't forget at the end to properly label the graphs with um, the axes uh, and their units. So on the y-axis, I want to put um, one over time and the units, seconds to the minus one, just taken straight from the table, and concentration of I minus and the units, moles, 
per decimeter cubed. Okay. Now this graph paper, um, you want to use as much of it as possible, um, but you don't want to choose a scale that makes it very difficult to plot. Some people tried to um, plot scales with, say, using three large squares um, for 10 units. Well, that makes it very difficult to know what a small square represents. So pick a sensible scale. So if we start with the x-axis, so the largest um, number for the x-axis is 0.01. Um, and the smallest is 0 0.004, so it, it kind of makes sense to go down to zero. Um, so an appropriate scale to use on this axis uh, would be something like this. And then fill in 0 0.0075. And these are, these are all values in the table, so that makes that... Um, nice and easy and 0 0.0025 and I've used enough of this scale um, here that the square is available for, to make that sensible um, then if I look at the uh, y-axis um, so that's these values here the largest value is 0 0.025 the smallest is 0 0.01 again makes sense to to use the origin so I can go 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.025, 0 0.003 0 here, and 0 0.015, 0 0.005. Okay, so. That's the scale, then I've simply got to plot the points. So the first point is um, 0 0.01 and 0 0.025. So that is here. Uh, 0 0.0075 and 0 0.0, 0 0.0188. So that is around there and point zero zero five and point oh one two five so that's very easy um, that's that point there and then the final one is point zero zero four zero and point zero one so that's uh, this line here and point zero four zero. Oh, so I've got those points and as you can see they uh, very neatly form a straight line to the origin so by using a ruler join those points together obviously a line of best fit but the data has been very kindly set out so that pretty much the points lie on the line and the mark scheme for this uh, question the first mark was um, to correctly plot one over time in other words rate against concentration with uh, the axes correctly labeled um, and correct values and the second mark was to use a sensible scale and to have all points reasonably correct with the straight line drawn so there was flexibility to perhaps have one uh, point slightly out but you needed to plot fairly accurately and and draw a reasonable line uh, obviously that line didn't have to come through the origin if you didn't include an origin but um, it makes sense to do so for, for later on in the in the question Okay, so turning over, uh, they've said to you one over time is a measure of the initial rate of the reaction. So um, deduce uh, the order of the reaction with respect to iodide ions and justify your answer. So uh, it's a straight line going through the origin. Hopefully um, you have in your mind 
something like this that uh, so you obviously wouldn't draw this on the paper but just just to um, so you have in mind the kind of graphs uh, so if you've got rate against concentration graphs rate minus minus 3.15 equals minus 0.69 equals so I'm taking this away from this so it's minus EA over R multiplied by 3.31 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 3.20 times 10 to the minus 3 so that is 0 0.11 times 10 to the minus 3 and the uh, C's cancel each other out. So I can then rearrange that equation by uh, bringing all of this onto this hand side. So minus EA equals minus 0.69 multiplied by R which is 8.31 divided by 0.11 times 10 to the minus 3 so the negatives cancel each other out and I get EA equals plus 52100 joules per mole and that's two three significant figures which I think um, is the appropriate number of significant figures given that you've got three significant figures in this data table. So that's my answer with method one. Method two, um, which would be to think about the kind of graph um, that you would get. Even, you can plot a graph with two points obviously and work out um, a gradient. You're not given graph paper but you can think about that graph and what it would be like. So um, if you can imagine plotting uh, on on this axis here, ln one over time, and this axis here, one over temperature. You can then put the points um, that you've been given. So this is an this is a negative scale, um, which can make it uh, slightly confusing to get the right way around. So you would put minus three point one five here. So this scale is um, and minus. 3.84 so you basically got your two two points on this axis here and this axis here one over time you've got 3.20 times 10 to the minus 3 and 3.31 times 10 to the minus 3 So you've basically constructed a triangle whereby one point is minus 3.15 and 3.20 and the other point is minus 38.84 and 3.31 times 10 to the minus 3. So those are my two points that I would plot on a graph of ln 1 over time against 1 over t. And I know that on that graph, according to this equation, if I plot this again on the y-axis against this, that the gradient of the straight line will be minus Ea over r. And so the gradient of this line is minus Ea over R.
So your first mark would be for this method be for saying gradient equals minus EA over R. And then the second would be for working out the gradient using this triangle. So you can work out the edge of this triangle and the edge of this triangle. So this is minus uh, 0.69. And along this is 0.11 times 10 to the minus 3. And so the gradient here equals so the gradient equals minus 0 0.69 divided by 0 0.11 times 10 to the minus 3 and that equals ea minus ea over r and then I can rearrange that in the same way that I did above to get EA equals plus 52100 joules per mole. The three significant figures. Okay, and then the final um, part of the question is to suggest how the reliability of the activation energy determination could be improved without changing the apparatus solution or method so uh, that was key to lots of that if you didn't get the mark it might have been because you were trying to uh, suggest improvements to um, accuracy for example by using more accurate um, apparatus and so on um, so really the, the the best answers that you could give would be to say that either you repeat uh, the the readings at these two temperatures a number of times to exclude any anomalies um, and to um, get a, a mean value for for the readings at these temperatures or uh, probably I think better still to say do a larger range of temperatures and then plot a graph um, and you could, you'd have more data points in order to plot your graph and work out the gradient um, being minus EA over R so your two options really for, for this were um, record data at a, ra a greater range of temperatures or uh, your alternative would be to say um, take multiple readings at the two temperatures and exclude any anomalies take a mean okay so that's the end of that question hi everyone uh, this is dr mancino and i'm going to go through question 19 start of section c this question is all about equilibrium and it focuses on the decomposition of hydrogen iodide into iodine and hydrogen. Uh, gives you some information, stuff that you must read and take note of. There's, there's, there's a lot of information in here that you need to get your head around in order to get a feel for what the question um, is asking you about. And we'll move straight on to question A, part one. How would the appearance of the contents of a tube change as it was cooled to room temperature? Well, if you look at this equilibrium mixture, it contains three gases, HI, iodine, and hydrogen. Now, uh, what you should know from your, uh, your chemistry uh, experience thus far is that iodine as a gas is a purple vapor or a purple gas. 
Hydrogen is a colourless gas. Hydrogen iodide is also a colourless gas. So this equilibrium mixture would be purple in colour because of the iodine vapour. So if you're going to talk about how the appearance of something changes, you must always say what it starts off as and what it then becomes, so a before and after. So the first mark would be for saying it would be a purple vapour. And the second mark is for saying that when that vapour is cooled down, one thing you should know is that when iodine is cooled to room temperature, the gas sublimes, i.e. it goes straight back to the solid state, and iodine as a solid at room temperature is a greyish black solid. So this question, for two marks, you would say that the purple vapour of iodine, one mark, uh, turns into a grey solid or a greyish black solid. If you mentioned that a solid was produced and nothing else, you get one mark for that. If you mentioned that it was a purple liquid or a purple solid, that, uh, get, that is rejected, that's not allowed, because of course iodine, iodine is only purple in the, in the gaseous state, not in the solid or the liquid state. Okay. Part two, oops, I won't go too far ahead. How could you show that equilibrium had been established? So if we go back to the information, um, it says that the sealed tubes uh, were left to heat at 700 Kelvin for some time. It doesn't specify how long. It does say that after a few days, this equilibrium um, is reached, uh, but it doesn't tell us how long it's been heated for. So what we want to know is, um, has equilibrium been reached uh, based on these on this description? Well, what does that mean? What has equilibrium been reached? Well, what we're, what we're trying to say is that has dynamic equilibrium been set up, i.e. is the forward rate equal to the backward rate? If that's the case, then the, the concentrations of reactants and products will not be changing. Because uh, as soon as you make product, pro products in this case, they will then react uh, to produce more of the reactant in the reverse reaction. And because both rates are, are, are equal, um, there's no net change in the concentrations of reactant and product. So this, what this question is getting at part two is that um, if equilibrium has been established, then the concentrations of reactants and products would be fixed. They would not change. So what we could do is we could uh, take our mixture, we could heat it for, for an additional period of time, say a couple of days, and then after that time, we could then uh, measure the concentrations of either reactant or product and compare it to what the concentrations were before we heated it for that extra period of time. And if the concentrations are the same, then we can say that equilibrium has been reached. So uh, a decent model answer for this question is that you would heat the mixture for a different length of time or an additional period of time, as I said, maybe a couple of days. Um, then you would measure the concentrations of either a reactant or a product. And if it's then the same as what it was before you heated it, then you can prove that equilibrium has been reached. Another way of thinking about it, if, if it's hard to measure the concentration, you could look at the color of this mixture. We've already said from the first part that this mixture would have a, a purple appearance because of the iodine gas. So you could heat it for an addi additional period of time if the colour doesn't change, uh, which you would obviously measure the colour intensity using a colorimeter, if you get the same reading, if the colour is the same after you know, a couple of extra days of, of heating, then that also proves that equilibrium has been reached because you haven't affected the or changed the iodine concentration and thus the concentrations of HI and H2 will also be uh, constant. Okay. Uh, part B uh, is calculation. Okay, so it gives us uh, the equilibrium concentrations from one experiment um, of HI, H2 and I2. Uh, the volume of the tube is 30 centimetres cubed and it wants us to calculate the initial mass of hydrogen iodide. So of course, uh, if we want to work out the mass of hydrogen iodide, we are at some point going to have to know the moles of hydrogen iodide that was present at the start. All right, so that's what we're leading back to. Okay, if we want to know the moles of HI at the start, we need to know the total moles of everything once equilibrium has been reached. And that will be equal to the moles of HI at the beginning of the experiment, i.e. before equilibrium was um, obtained. 
So uh, we know the volume of the tube and we know the concentrations of each of the three components. So we can work out the moles, the total number of moles from all three components. So this is how we would do it. As you remember from AS, moles equals the volume in decimeters cubed multiplied by the concentration. So the volume in this case, so let's do it for one each gas in turn. So we do it for HI. Moles of HI is equal to 30 over a thousand. That converts the centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed. The concentration of HI is 0 0.00353. Put that into the calculator and we should get 1.059 times 10 to the power of minus four moles. And that's of HI. We do the same process for H2 and for I2. So 30 over a thousand. We can use the same volume because all the gases are in the same tube. So they all occupy the same volume. This time the concentration of H2 is 0 0.00048. We work that through and we get the value of 1.44 times 10 to the power of minus five moles. Okay, the moles of I2 will be the same as the moles of hydrogen. That's because the concentrations of both gases are the same at equilibrium. Okay, so if we repeat that calculation, we get the same answer as, as the one above. Okay, so these are the moles of all the gases at, at, at equilibrium. Therefore, the, all of these moles, all of these, uh, the moles of H2 and I2 came from HI because it was HI decomposed in the first place. So these are the, this is the moles of HI at equilibrium. And these are the moles of H2 and I2 that are produced at equilibrium. It therefore follows that the moles of HI at the beginning is equal to the sum of all of these three. So the moles of HI initial equals the sum of these three values. So if we, if I label this A, B, and C, do A plus B plus C, we get the value of 1.347 times 10 to the power of minus four moles. So that's our initial moles of HI. But the question wants us to calculate the initial mass. Well, as you should remember, moles is equal to mass over relative formula mass. So the mass that we, this is the mass we're trying to calculate is equal to the moles times the relative formula mass. So the, mole, the mass of HI is equal to the moles, which is the answer from the, the line above. Now the, the relative formula mass of HI is the, is the uh, individual, is the sum of the um, relative atomic masses of hydrogen and iodine. So it's 126.9 plus one, so it's 127.9. And if we work that through, we get an answer of 0 0.0172 grams. And that's our final answer, okay? If you did all of that and put the right answer in with no working, you get five. Okay, so well done to those of you who did that. However, that's a risky strategy because if you make a mistake any of these stages here, um, obviously that's going to affect your final answer. So you'll obviously lose marks for not getting the correct answer at the end. So it's always a good idea to show the um, show your working. Now, where the marks are allocated, the individual marks, uh, you've got one mark for calculating the moles of HI. At equilibrium, one mark for stating or calculating the moles of H2 and I2. So these two together gave you a mark. Uh, you got one mark for adding up the moles to give you the total mark of the initial moles of HI. You got one mark for correctly calculating the RFM or MR of HI to be 126.9 plus 1, 127.9. And then of course you get the final mark for the correct answer. Um, the mark scheme uh, does say that if you got if you made mistakes at this stage and therefore got the wrong initial moles, if you use that wrong number of initial moles, but still multiply that number by the RFM, 
you've got a mark for this set, set section, even if that value there is wrong. And therefore, if you've done the correct calculation of the calculator, you also get a mark for your mass. So it is possible, even if you screw up here, it is possible to get two marks from this last bit here. Okay, but obviously, hopefully we're looking for more than, more than two. Um, write an expression for the equilibrium constant. Well, that's, that's straightforward. The equilibrium uh, is given on the previous page. I'm just going to write it here to remind you. Okay, so equilibrium constants, we're looking at Kc. So these are our concentration terms. So it's not Kp. Okay, so it's the concentrations of the products divided by the reactants, taking into account any, any balancing numbers, which then become uh, powers. So Kc is equal to the concentration of I2 multiplied by the concentration of H2, all divided by the concentration of Hi squared. Squared because, of course, we have the number two uh, as a balancing number in the equation. Okay, one mark for that. Uh, uh, calculate the value. Well, here what you do is you would use the values um, from the table, plug them in, um, and get your answer. So you would get Kc is equal to uh, 0.004, whoops, 48, multiplied by itself again, because the concentrations of Hi, so H2 and I2 are the same, divided by the concentration of Hi. This time you have to square it, follow it through, and you get the answer of 0.0185. Okay, and that's one mark for that. So, straightforward. Okay, mark scheme says allow all significant figures except one significant figure. Okay, which is obviously common common sense. Right here, we've got three significant figures, so that's a sensible number of significant figures uh, with which to quote the answer to. Fantastic. Okay, part four. Does this equilibrium constant have units? Explain your answer. Well, um, no. <laughs> in, in essence, uh, the equilibrium does not have units. And the reason is that if we look back at the equilibrium expression, what we're doing is we're doing concentration times concentration on the top divided by concentration squared on the bottom. So we've got concentration squared divided by concentration squared. So the units of concentration will cancel. Or in other words, we have the same number of moles um, in, the, in the equation for products as we have reactants. We have two moles on this side, two moles on that side. So uh, that means that the, that the units will cancel. So going back to the question, no, the concentration cancel. Okay. Or in other words, another way of saying it, you wouldn't have to do it, you wouldn't have to write both of these, one or the other would be fine. There are the same number of moles of reactants and products. Okay. So one mark for that explanation. Okay, moving on. So now we have uh, the equation written in a slightly different way. This time we've divided the balancing numbers by two to give us uh, to give us uh, some non-whole numbers at the front. Okay, that doesn't matter. We can still write um, a slightly modified Kc, Kc prime. It's still reactants or products over reactants, concentrations. This time we raise the concentrations of H2 the power of a half, i.e. we square root it, in other words, i2 is the same, and this time hi on the bottom is not raised to any power, what raised to the power one, which keeps it the same, okay? So this time we're given some, some more data, and we're asked to calculate this new value of Kc, Kc prime, okay, so we'll just pl plug the numbers in, concentration of And that's of H2, well, they're both the same as it, as it says in the table. 
okay, all over the concentration of HI, which is 0 0.0353. Okay, take care with the calculator here. Make sure that you you plug the numbers in correctly, raise it, to, raise it to the right power, do things in the correct order. Otherwise you get calculator error, it's a very common mistake. Um, and if you carry that through, the final answer will be 0 0.136. Again, there will be no units because the units cancel, there's the same number of moles of reactants and products. Even for this modified equation, there's one mole of re reactant and a total of one mole of product if you add both these half moles together. So the units cancel. Um, and so there's two marks in this question. There's one mark for that. The second mark is for this part, which is deduce the relationship between this value and the value calculated in B part three. Now let's remind ourselves, there's a little egg memoir down here. B part three value was 0.0185. So I'd probably tend to put it here as a little reminder to me. Okay, so if we compare these two numbers, okay, at first glance, there's not much, really, there's not much we can say about them. But if we look at the two KCs, um, we've got KC primed is equal to H2 to the half, I2 to the half over HI. The, the other KC is H2 squared, I2 squared, HI squared, sorry, oops, oops, mistake there. Okay, if we look at these two closely together, all we've done for we go to KC, to KC prime, is we square rooted this whole term. So if you square root each of these terms, well, the square root of H2 will be H2 to the half, square root of I2 will be I2 to the half, and the square root of HI squared will just become HI. So what we can say is that uh, Kc primed, this new Kc, is the square root of the old Kc, the previous one. Okay. Or another way of writing that is Kc primed squared is equal to the old Kc. Now the way to prove that is to actually do it mathematically. Okay. So you would put, um, uh, let's have a look. You would put this value in the calculator. Do the square root of this. Sorry, do the square root. Hold on, let me think, think about this carefully because I'm getting confused. That's what happens sometimes even for a teacher. This value is the square root of that value there. That's right. So if you were to, yeah, that's right. This is the square root of that value there. Apologize for that. So yeah, anything like this or like that or saying this, this value is the square root of that value will get you the second mark. Okay, and the last part of question 19, um, probably the hardest qu mark, uh, question, like, uh, part of the question in question 19, is to think about the effect of pressure uh, on the position of equilibrium. So this reaction um, is similar to the last one, except this time, the iodine that's formed is a solid, uh, and the HI is still a gas, H2 is a gas. So now the, the equilibrium um, term for Kp is different, because now we only, we only consider gases, so it's the partial pressure of hydrogen divided by the partial pressure of HI squared. Okay, Use the expression for Kp to explain the effect of an increase in total pressure on the position of equilibrium. Okay, so... What we've, the first thing you should always remember about Kp or even Kc is that the only variable that can affect the value of K, whether it's Kc or Kp, is temperature. And that's because of its relationship to, to entropy. Um, so even if we change the pressure of uh, the gases inside the vessel, the equilibrium constant will not change. Okay. So the first thing to say is that Kp will not change, it remains constant. Okay, that's quite important, it's very important, okay? That's the first mark. The second mark is for saying that if you increase the total pressure, then of course the partial pressures of both these gases will increase. But of course the one that increased most 
is going to be the HI. And that's because its partial pressure is squared. So if you consider the ratio partial pressure of H2 over partial pressure of HI squared, or, yeah, uh, you could put it there instead, okay? Um, both of them will increase, but because this is a squared term, the bottom line, or the, the denominator, will increase uh, by a greater proportion than the top line. So what will that do to the ratio of H2 over HI? Well, if we're dividing it by a, a bigger number, then this ratio will decrease. So this ratio will decrease because uh, partial pressure of HI, or I'll rewrite that because the denominator increases by a greater amount than the numerator. The numerator, of course, is the top line. So what does that do? Well, it now means that Kp is no longer equal to, to this. Okay, because if this has now got, if this whole term here, this what we call the quotient, has got smaller, it's now no longer the same as Kp. Remember, Kp is uh, unaffected. So this number is set. This ratio decreases. That means that the system is now no longer in equilibrium. Because for it to be in equilibrium, the quotient term must equal the, the value of K. Okay. So how are we going to, what will the system have to do in order to make this quotient bigger to then re-equal Kp? Well, obviously, we are going to have to increase the partial pressure of H2 so that now this ratio gets back to where it was before. Okay. So to restore... the quotient back to being equal to Kp, the partial pressure of H2, H2 sorry, has to increase. And of course, then the partial pressure of Hi will have to decrease. And it will do that in such a way, it'll do it until the ratio is then re-equal to Kp. So to restore the quotient back to being equal to Kp, the pressure of H2 has to increase and the partial pressure of Hi has to decrease. Well, how is that going to, how can the uh, system do that? Well, of course, the question is all about the position of equilibrium. The way that you can decrease the pressure of Hi and increase the pressure of H2 is for the equilibrium to shift to the right hand side. So it moves in that direction until it reaches a point where the ratio, the quotient, is then equal to Kp. So therefore, the equilibrium position shifts to the right. So one mark for saying Kp won't change, another mark for saying that uh, the ratio of partial pressure of hydrogen to Hi will decrease, and another mark for saying that in order to restore the quotient back, the equilibrium must shift to the right-hand side so that we increase the partial pressure of H2, decrease the HI partial pressure until that ratio is then re-equal to Kp. And then the system is back in equilibrium and everything is hunky-dory. Okay, well, that concludes question 19. Uh, I apologise for the, um, my hesitation over, over this. Sometimes when you see lots of numbers and, and symbols on that on a page, it can be a bit confusing, but hopefully uh, you've made sense of that. Um, okay, thank you very much for listening. And now on to Mr. Cornish for question 20. Over to you. Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen, we're doing question 20 out of the A2 mock paper. What you'll need to do first in this question, any question that looks like this, is have a good read through the pretext. There's quite a lot of information 
The things that are most important are the structures that you're going to be asked about, that you'll need to refer back to, and specifically this paragraph here about ethoxyethane. Do refer back to this during the question because there's many hints and tips in there. The first question, A part one, is relatively straightforward. It's a intermolecular forces question where you need to talk about ethoxyethane, the dipole-dipole interactions, and the London forces versus ethanol, which has hydrogen bonds. That gets you the first two marks. The third mark is for saying that more energy is needed to separate the ethanol molecules because the hydrogen bond bonds are the most uh, strong. A part two, a rather specific question, um, and I'll show you the answers now. Um, you need to pick three of these six, as I say, very specific answers. Pause the video now if you'd like to look at those in more detail. Moving on to part three. It's just why uh, it's, this molecule is more stable. Well, it's because the CF bonds are stronger than the CH bonds. Because they're stronger, this molecule remains in the atmosphere for a greater amount of time, and hence has a greater effect as a greenhouse gas. Procaine, then, uh, is basic. It tells you it's basic. Why? Because there's a lone pair on the nitrogen for the first mark. The second and third marks can come from one or two examples. The easier example for you at this point will be the fact that the lone pairs of the nitrogen bonded to the alkyl groups, that's CH3 groups for example, are more basic. Why are they more basic? Because of the inductive effect. We can see that here where the arrows represent the electrons moving down the bond towards the nitrogen, freeing up these electrons to act as a base. The other explanation is to do with benzene and the overlap of the benzene free electrons with the nitrogen lone pair, which means it's less basic. That will come up soon in your current topics. Part C, part one, here we have a reversible reaction. That's the main disadvantage, the only disadvantage that we're concerned about. And it leads on nicely to this alternative two-stage synthesis of benzocaine that we're concerned about. There's three main marks, and I'm sure you put this in more detail, which you'll need to. But the first mark is for using PCL5, and that gives us this intermediate here. And then we add ethanol at the end to give us the product. A little bit of NMR for you on part D. There's lots to read through again. Do read through it. Um, we're concerned about this spectrum here, which corresponds to the this molecule. If I just zoom out slightly, we should be able to see all of it. The easiest one to get around is E. You can see E has got the strongest signal strength, i.e. it's got the biggest integral, which corresponds to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 E protons. The C proton bonded to the uh, oxygen, we know that's around about 5 ppm. And B is the only other single proton in, uh, in, in an environment. So B and C are quite straightforward. A and D require a little bit more thought. However, protons directly ben uh, bonded to a benzene ring do have a high ppm up here at over 7, when those at D um, are here at just over 3. The, most, the easiest way to interpret this initially is to look at the integrals. And then the final question, HPLC versus NMR. The HPLC is going to be better and you need to talk about why. If we think about chromatography in general, then we're only going to see one peak. Or if we think about really basic chromatography, one spot if we only have one thing present. So the purity is, is, is easy to see if we only get one peak in HPLC. The problem with NMR is impurities or trace impurities, they're not going to be very concentrated. So those peaks given off by those trace impurities are likely to be hidden due to the background there. That's question 20. It's 20 marks. It's quite substantial. And as I said at the beginning, you should be referring back to the pretext quite often.